So 80 years ago today, the Battle of Guadalcanal started. On August 7th, 1942, east of the two major islands of New Guinea and Australia lies a barrier of smaller islands, which extends from the Bismarck Archipelago to New Caledonia. This was the Solomon Islands. As a series of potential air and sea bases, these islands offered the Japanese in the spring of 1942 the attractive possibility of cutting deep into the South Pacific and severing Australia's and New Zealand's ties to Western America. Now, there's a campaign that was put together to rid Australia and New Zealand of the menace of Japanese invasion and to shield our tenuous lines of communication to all those important bases that they put together by April of 1942 by the combined chiefs of staff. Now, there was a period of time where it amounted to a little more than paper strategy, but after they had finished the repairs of all the ships and the fleet that was done during the attack on Pearl Harbor and the consolidation of their reinforcement of the United Nations in the Southwest Pacific, the project started off and began to be more feasible. On July 4th, the enemy landed a considerable force of soldiers and laborers on Guadalcanal Island, just south of Tulagi and Florida Islands. And a few days later, our reconnaissance planes had observed that a landing field was being built on the north coast of the island, not far from Lunga Point. This landing field would later become known as Henderson Field, and capturing the airfield would become a primary objective during this battle. As the operation of land-based planes from Guadalcanal would immediately imperil our control of the New Hebrides and New Caledonia area, the necessity of our regaining that island became increasingly apparent. In in order to begin what was going to be considered our first major offensive in the Pacific, they created a new command under Vice Admiral Robert L. Gormley after it was approved by the United Nations. There were also frequent conferences that were held with Major General Alexander A. Vandergriff, who was tasked to lead our occupation force as the commander of the 1st Marine Division at the time. For those of you that don't know, Major General Alexander A. Vandergriff would go on to become the Commandant of the Marine Corps later on. In any case, on June 25th, Admiral Gormley received orders to initiate the attack as soon as was as possible. The very next day, he informed General Vandegrift of the operation for which the 1st Marine Division was going to be reinforcing the 2nd Marines, the 1st Raider Battalion, and the 3rd Defense Battalion. D-Day was set for August 1st, meaning that the invasion was set and they wanted the invasion to begin on August 1st. Because of how severe this was at the time, and how serious this was, there was extreme secrecy enforced for it. And the Marines that were making their preparations for this were doing it under the guise of getting ready for a period of amphibious training and not an invasion. So on July 7th, Admiral Gormley flew to Australia for a two-day meeting with General Douglas MacArthur, during which they closed a working agreement with all the cooperation forces that were going to be available to the two commanders. On his return to Auckland, the Admiral received orders to proceed with instructions that the first phase of the operation, which was to capture Florida and Guadalcanal, be undertaken, if not on August 1st, as near to that date as possible. Now, when the enemy took over Guadalcanal, they immediately started constructing an airport, wharves, and other instruments. Installations. Simultaneously, they commenced a parallel movement down the east coast of New Guinea on July 21st to 22nd, putting troops ashore on Basi and at Buna. Both of these operations, specifically at Guadalcanal, were supported by considerable numbers of sea and land-based planes. Now, after we started gaining this type of intelligence, it was a sign that we needed to hurry the hell up and get out there. It was becoming increasingly apparent that if we didn't act soon, the enemy would be so firmly entrenched in that area, it was going to be difficult to dislodge them. So because of the enemy's losses in the Battle of Mid way in the Coral Sea battles, and also because of intelligence reports that were gathered by air power, we didn't have any current intelligence at the time that there were any majorly large ships in the area near the Solomons. Based on this intelligence, it was reasonably believed that the forces on the islands consisted almost exclusively of just planes, submarines, and small surface craft. So the thing that concerned the commanders at this time was the major land plane base that the Japanese had established at Rabaul in New Britain, which is about 675 miles from Guadalcanal, and the bases that they were building at Kita and Bougainville Island, which was only about 300 miles from Guadalcanal. And the reason why is because that would be a serious threat to any ships that were conducting ship-to-shore operations or any ships that were out there to support the troops in the invasion. Now, the plan that they provided, for the most part, consisted of three major task forces. Two of them were placed under the command of Vice Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher. The second task force, Terror, was under Rear Admiral Richmond K. Turner, known as the Amphibious Force. And this was to make the principal attack, transporting and landing the occupying force of Marines and defending the transport convoys against surface attack. The third force, which was Task Force Mike, under Rear Admiral John S. McCain, was to supply aerial scouting and advanced bombing of the operations area by land-based planes and seaplanes. 
On July 22nd, Admiral McCain reported to Admiral Gormley that his planes would begin a search two days before the attack to ensure detection of any enemy entering the Coral Sea. The air attack on Tulagi and Guadalcanal actually began a week before our ships even sighted the two islands. The air support force consisting of the carriers Saratoga, Enterprise, and Wasp, and their screening ships was ordered by Admiral Fletcher to proceed to Guadalcanal area to cooperate with Admiral Turner's amphibious force by supplying air offense and defense, also while protecting itself from enemy air attacks, making air searches whenever they were ordered or was seen or was advisable. The carriers and their escorts were to operate southwest of Guadalcanal with the Saratoga in the center lane, the Wasp to the west and south, and the Enterprise to the north and east at distances of 8,000 to 12,000 yards. As the primary fighter control ship, the Enterprise was to furnish the combat patrol for all three carriers. Now, against all the enemy forces and installation in the whole target area, General Vandegrift planned to use approximately 15,000 men with 5,000 more as a reserve, just in case they needed them. Now, the landing force elements comprised of the following. The 1st Marine Division consisted of 12,900 people. They had 5th Battalion, 11th Marines attached, 1st Tank Battalion, and they also had some detachments. So 2nd Marines reinforced was about 4,846 people. 1st Raider Battalion had about 828 people and 3rd Defense Battalion had 972 for a total of like 19,546 people. Now on Guadalcanal, the enemy was believed to have 5,275 troops divided as follows. They had one regiment reinforced, which was about 2,300 men, one anti-aircraft regiment, which was about 500 men, one heavy machine gun battalion, which was 325 men, two engineer units, which was about 1,050 men, air personnel and service squadrons of about 200 men, and a labor unit, which was about 900 people. The major four part of these troops was believed to be concentrated between Kukum, just west of Lunga Point, and the mouth of the Tanaru River, with a small garrison at Tater and other small detachments elsewhere. Installations consisted of docks at Kukum and Lunga Point, and stores, motor transport, and a radio station at Lunga. The airfield southeast of Lunga was believed to have been completed with another at Tater and possibly a third at Tanaru under construction. Artillery was believed to be confined to eight heavy anti-aircraft guns between Kukum and the Lunga River. Dog Day, or D-Day, the day that they were scheduling to attack, was tentatively set for August 7th, which is about a week's delay because they, they needed to wait for the arrival of some of the transports and cargo ships at Wellington. So they were waiting on them to arrive, so they pushed it to the right a little bit. Now, the forces under the command of Admiral Gormley would successively seize, occupy, and defend to Tulagi and adjacent positions and the Santa Cruz Islands for the purposes of denying those areas to the enemy and in preparation for further offensive action. Prior to the actual attack in the Solomons, they held rehearsals in the Fijis on or about July 27th. So commanding officers of the troops were made responsible for the complete unloading of their ships, and they were ordered to leave sufficient men on board to ensure that all holds were worked on a 24-hour basis. Basic priorities for landing supplies and material were established in this order. Number one priority was ammunition. Number two, was water. Number three was combat transportation. Four was rations. Five was medical supplies. Six, gasoline. Seven, transportation other than combat. Eight, miscellaneous. Traffic in beach areas was to be controlled by shore party commanders. Inland traffic by units of military police. Shore party commanders were directed to call upon troop commanders in their immediate vicinity for assistance in handling supplies from landing beaches to dumps. At approximately 903 to 909, the naval bombardment of the shore began. At 913, the first troops landed on Beach Red. 1100, ships moved in closer to the beach. 1200, the Haywood arrives at Beach Red. 1320, Japanese high-level bombers attack. And 1500, Japanese dive bombers attack. So the fighting in Tulagi and Givutu were pretty rough and pretty fierce during the occupation of that, but when they occupied Guadalcanal, it proceeded with almost amazing smoothness comparatively. There were two reasons for this. First, we had expected that we were going to encounter the greatest resistance on Guadalcanal, and they concentrated the major part of their landing forces at Guadalcanal because they thought the fighting was going to be the worst there. The second thing was the enemy retreated to the hills of Guadalcanal and basically allowed us to establish ourselves on the northern shore when we got there. Whereas in Tulagi and the other small islands off Florida, 
the enemy was trapped and refusing to surrender, oftentimes fighting down to the last man, which was obviously a real problem. Our cruiser planes had dropped smoke bombs, indicating the limits of the beach. Fire support for the landing was to begin 10 minutes before zero hour and was to last five minutes, while our boats were moving in from 2,700 to 1,300 yards from the beach. Soon after 0900, it began. The Quincy covered the area west of Beach Red to a depth of 200 yards and assisted the Astoria in covering the western third of the beach. The Dewey and Hull bombarded the eastern third of the beach and Ella and Wilson at the center. Immediately after our troops landed, the two destroyer sections were to take positions, respectively east and west of the thousand yard wide boat lane, to provide five minutes of close fire support while the Astoria was to follow the westward progress of our troops along the beach and provide whatever support was necessary. This latter part of the program proved unnecessary, but while our boats were landing, each cruiser expended 45 rounds of 8-inch and 205-inch, and each destroyer fired 200 rounds. The fire support ships had received instructions not to fire on wars, pontoons, jetties, bridges, or lighters, which were offering no threat to our operations. They were also ordered to use illuminating projectiles for incendiary purposes against inflammable targets such as fuel dumps. In order not to endanger our boats, only the percussion feature of all projectiles was to be used. So the barrage ceased at 0909, and at 0913, three minutes after zero hour, the first troops landed without opposition on Beach Red between Lunga and Coley Points. Within an hour, a beach master was established and in communication with Admiral Turner in the Macaulay. Shortly thereafter, a dispatch was received reporting that submarines were en route to attack our ships. General Vandergrift, who had his division headquarters while afloat in the Macaulay, took command on Guadalcanal soon after the landing. The Assistant Division Commander General William H. Rupertus coordinated operations in the Tulagi Gavutu, Florida area, first from the Neville and later from Beach Blue in Tulagi. Throughout the course of the day, about 11,000 Marines were shuttled ashore. Now, during this time, supplies were piling up on Beach Red faster than could be moved away because they were trying to get there as fast as they possibly could. They didn't want anybody to just be sitting idly and have transports sitting in the water when they were in a vulnerable position to be bombed. So they're trying to get all of the supplies on shore as fast as possible. And so they ended up piling up on shore before they were able to move them around and sort them properly. By the time it was dark out, there was about 100 loaded boats and 50 more waiting offshore ready to drop off supplies. Now, although the fact that they continued working throughout the night under lights, it became necessary to call off the unloading because of the congestion. Now, there were enemy counterattacks by air on August 7th. At 10.45, Coast Watchers sent out a warning that there was an enemy air attack incoming. 1300, the Enterprise fighters sight the enemy. 1315, Chicago's radar picks up enemy planes. 1320, 22 Japanese high-level bombers attack the transports. 1430, Enterprise fighters sight second formation of raiders. 1500, Saratoga fighters sight enemy. 1500, 10 Japanese dive bombers attacked the transports. On the President Adams, it was remarked that they resembled DC-3 Douglas transports and that they were finished in a bright silver color, exactly like commercial airliners. The planes were sighted by our ships off Florida, but they were out of range. Apparently, the enemy was interested only in the larger targets presented by our array of transports at Guadalcanal. As the planes approached this group, screening ships and transports opened fire. One enemy bomber staggered, then crashed into the sea, then a second crashed in flames, and third commenced to lose altitude and was last seen gliding down downward over the hills of Guadalcanal trailing smoke. The 47 remaining planes attempting a pattern bombing showed very poor marksmanship. At the same time, scattered clouds at 10,000 feet made it extremely difficult for our ships to appraise the effectiveness of the anti-aircraft fire. Within 10 minutes, the enemy raiders had disappeared behind Guadalcanal's mountain peaks and the ships ceased fire. No ship had been hit, but the Dewey shortly afterwards picked up the pilot of one of our carrier fighters, which had been knocked down in the battle overhead. It was estimated that the ship's anti-aircraft fire had accounted for two Japanese planes destroyed and two more damaged. A little over an hour at approximately 1445, seven to ten single engine dive bombers suddenly attacked the ships. From Guadalcanal, it appeared that they approached from the direction of Tulagi, flying high above Squadron Yoke off Florida. They dived steeply on Squadron X-Ray off Guadalcanal. One scored a hit on the Mugford, damaging her superstructure deck just forward and to starboard of their number three five-inch gun. Although considerable damage was done and a fire was started, repairs were effected in a few hours. Personal casualties were eight men killed, 14 missing, and 17 wounded. It is apparent from some of the ship's reports that they felt they had not been adequately protected by our own aircraft during these raids. The Enterprise, being that it was the primary fighter control ship, was responsible for directing the combat patrol over all three carriers. This division of control and operation of the combat patrols apparently created some confusion because the fighters, when over the carriers, were directed to take orders from the Enterprise, but when they proceeded relatively few miles to positions over the transports, they were to obey the director on the Chicago. 
ago. So this confusion, this this confusion of coordination and communication caused issues with like who is in charge of who and like who am I supposed to be taking orders from right now? Which is natural when you're having a massive operation like this and you've got tons of generals in place. I'm sure the same things happen in tons of other battles throughout history where like somebody was in charge of one sector or one area and then there's somebody else that was in charge of another area. But when you leave that area and when you cross into this boundary, then somebody else becomes in control. So it becomes confusing and the con the, the communication piece gets really muddled. Now throughout the rest of that counterattack, the air counterattack, there was tons of fighting between tons of different planes on various different carriers and destroyers. And there was tons of anti-aircraft fire and there's a lot of downed Japanese planes and there are definitely downed American planes and allied planes as well. So land fighting the afternoon and night of August 7th. The first Marines to land on Guadalcanal were Combat Group A, 5th Marines, commanded by Colonel Leroy P. Hunt. They advanced inland at once, occupying a shallow beachhead bounded by the east branch of the Ilu, which runs generally parallel to the beach and 600 yards inland from it. And on the west, Combat Group B, 1st Marines, commanded by Colonel Clifton B. Cates, landed shortly afterwards on Beach Red, passing through Combat Group A, began an advance southwest into the interior. About the same time, the 1st Battalion of Group A crossed the Ilu and moved directly west along the shore with its objective, the mouth of the Tenaru River. Combat Group B, with its three battalions echelon to the left rear, advanced on a magnetic azimuth 260 towards an objective loosely defined as a grassy knoll. It was hoped that Combat Group B, by immediately moving into the interior of the island could get in behind the Japanese and stop them from escaping to the mountains. The advance proceeded slowly during the afternoon. The Ulu River and its east branch formed a half ring around the beachhead, and although these crossings had been anticipated and materials for temporary bridges had been brought along, our progress was delayed during their construction. Then the dense jungle on the other side of the river provided another obstacle. Eventually, the advance was halted at dusk in order to organize our lines and reorient the advance for the next day. By nightfall, however, the 1st Battalion of Combat Group A had reached the mouth of the Teneru about two miles west of Beach Red and established our right flank there. No contact with the enemy had been made anywhere at this point, at least not on land. Now, General Vandergriff wrote a personal letter that he believed that the easy success of the landing at Guadalcanal in the first few hours of the attack was as a result of the fact that the enemy was surprised that we were making a landing there because he believed that they didn't think we were going to be making a landing to occupy the islands. And in his words, he said the Japanese thought it was an air and surface ship raid. He goes on to say, with the first salvo, they beat it to the hills, intending to come back after we had departed. I wish they had stayed put. Now, at 0500 on the morning of the 8th, Admiral Crutchley ordered the outer patrol groups and units to return to the transport areas and to resume day screen. As enemy submarines might be expected to intrude during the day, he directed the minesweepers to form an anti-submarine patrol westward of Sealark and Lengo channels. He also established an anti-submarine air patrol with at least three cruiser planes in the air at all times. The WASP also maintained a continuous combat patrol of eight fighters over the Tulagi transport area until 1200. So there were bombers that were being supplied to the commander of the amphibious force for action against designated objectives. Fighters were getting recalled and refueled at noon in anticipation of a 67 enemy attack, which, as on the previous day, proved to be directed at the ships in the transport areas. In forwarding the reports of the Saratoga's air group, Captain DeWitt C. Ramsey stated that on August 7th, the Saratoga had been designated by Admiral Noyes to hold herself in readiness as a striking force the next day, in the event that it should prove advisable to make an attack on an enemy carrier believed to be in the vicinity. By the time it was August 8th on Guadalcanal, other than the, the major congestion of the boats and supplies on Beach Red, there was pretty satisfactory progress being made on the island. The advance to the west had been resumed early in the morning. The 1st Battalion of Combat Team A continued along the shore through the comparatively favorable terrain of flat coconut plantations. Combat Group B encountered a much more difficult set of terrain as they were going into the thick jungle several miles inland. A few prisoners were picked up during the morning, interrogated revealed that no large enemy force was in the vicinity and that the only regularly organized garrison had retreated to the west. Thus, at midday, it was decided that Combat Team A, 5th Marines, should move rapidly astride the road leading to Kakum and seize the village and enemy installations there. They crossed the Lunga River at the main bridge and encountered no opposition until their advance elements entered Kakum at 1500 on the 8th of August. This, however, amounted only to light fire from low knolls near the village and was quickly silenced. In the meantime, Company Bravo, 1st Marines, had been able to 
to make faster progress in the plains east of the airfield, and by 1600, they were in possession of the aerodrome, having encountered only one small enemy patrol. In five weeks, they had constructed large, semi-permanent camps, finger wharves, bridges, machine shops, two large radio stations, ice plants, two large and permanent electric power plants, an elaborate air compressor plant for torpedoes, and a nearly completed aerodrome with hangars, blast pens, and a 3,600-foot runway. Campsites had evidently been abandoned in a state of utter confusion. Arms and personal equipment were left behind in large quantities, and no effort had been made at demolition. Few dead were found as a result of the aerial and naval bombardment. According to General Vandergrift, it appeared that the daybreak bombardment caught the garrison completely by surprise, and a state of panic ensued, which was followed by a precipitate and disorderly flight to the west. The airfield we had captured was ready for almost immediate use by fighters and dive bombers. With few tools and no barbed wire, our troops were busily digging in to defend their valuable beachhead. The enemy forces on Guadalcanal had all withdrawn to the bush to the west. So the Japanese had offered vicious opposition and counterattacks to prevent our consolidation and extension of our positions on Guadalcanal. And throughout the remainder of August, they continued air attacks and several attempted landings, but they were all successfully driven off or mopped up. With September rolling around, they redoubled their efforts to try to bomb us off the island and they continued to try to like send reinforcements ashore. So there were small night landings by cruisers and destroyers, you know, which we nicknamed Tokyo Express. And this became increasingly common throughout the entire month of September and early October. Finally, by 18 September, 7th Marines, reinforced by 1st Battalion, 11th Marines, and other division troops finally arrived at Guadalcanal after training in jungle warfare in the Samoa Islands. Once the men landed, they were greeted with friendly faces by the Marines that were already on the island. A lot of the guys in 7th Marines thought that they were likely to be the first to see combat. Now, that division was careful to send some of their best men over to Samoa so that way they could get them trained up and get them prepped for this battle. And they finally had them back. Now, as luck would have it, a separate supply convoy reached the island at the same time when 7th Marines arrived, which brought aviation gas and ammunition and other types of supplies ashore, which is the first time they were able to get resupplied since the invasion in August. They badly needed those resupplies, so everybody was in pretty good spirits at that time. Now, the Navy covering force for the reinforcement and supply convoys was hit hard by Japanese submarines. The carrier Wasp was torpedoed and sunk. The battleship North Carolina was damaged, and the destroyer O'Brien was hit so badly it broke up and sank on its way to dry dock. The Navy had accomplished its mission, though. The 7th Marines landed, and they were able to get supplies ashore. But it was it was very costly. Fortunately, some of the aircraft that were part of the Wasp's crew were able to rejoin the other aircraft in the area to continue to support the mission. Now, at the time, the Hornet was the only fleet carrier left in the entire South Pacific. As the ships that brought the 7th Marines withdrew, they took with them the survivors of the 1st Parachute Battalion and sick bays full of badly wounded men. Now, after that reinforcement of Marines came ashore, General Vandergriff now had enough people on the island so he could expand his defensive scheme that he had set up. He had about 19,200 Marines on shore. So General Vandergriff decided to seize a forward position along the east bank of the Matanikau River, in effect strongly outposting his west flank defenses against the probability of string enemy attacks from the area where most Japanese troops were landing. First, however, he was going to test the Japanese reaction with a strong probing force. So for that probing force, he chose the fresh 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, who was commanded by, at the time, Lieutenant Colonel Louis B. Chesty Puller, to move inland along the slopes of Mount Austin and patrol north towards the coast and the Japanese-held area. So Lieutenant Colonel Chesty Puller moved his troops up towards the north coast, and they ran into Japanese troops that were bivouacked on the slopes of Austin on the 24th, and in a sharp firefight had seven men killed and 25 wounded. Vandergriff then sent 2nd Battalion 5th Marines forward to reinforce Puller and help provide the men needed to carry the casualties out of the jungle. Now that he was reinforced, Chesty Puller continued his advance moving down the east bank of the Matanikau. He reached the coast on the 26th as planned where he drew intensive fire from enemy positions on the ridges west of the river. Now 2nd Battalion 5th Marines attempted to cross the river but they were beaten back. Now 1st Raider Battalion originally was given a mission to establish a patrol base west of the Matanikau. During that time, they finally reached the vicinity of the firefight and they joined in as well. Now, following this, Vandegrift sent Colonel Edson, now the commander of the 5th Marines, forward to take charge of the expanded force. The battalion, commanded by Edson's former XO, Lieutenant Colonel Samuel B. Griffith II, ran into a hornet's nest of Japanese who had been crossing the Matanikau during the night. 
Now, Edson released a garbled message that was tough to, to interpret or understand, believing that Griffith's men were advancing according to plan, so he decided to land the companies of 1st Battalion, 7th Marines behind the enemy's Matanikau position and strike the enemy from the rear while Rosencrantz's men were attacking across the river. Now, these companies that were being shuttled ashore in 1st Battalion, 7th Marines happened to be getting brought to shore by some Coast Guardsmen, one of which was named Douglas Monroe, who at the time was only 22 years old, who took control of about 10 landing craft to move Chesty Puller's men to the western coast along with other landing crafts. After they successfully landed and moved about 500 yards inland, Monroe took all but one of those landing craft and returned back to the staging area after the, the landing had been conducted. The landing was made without any incident and the 7th Marines companies were able to move inland. However, just about an hour after they landed on the western coast of the island, the Marines were overcome by Japanese bombing raids, driving out their gunfire support, and then additionally, they were being heavily ambushed and cut off from the sea in many cases. So the Marines were being driven back to the beach, and many didn't have radios to even request for assistance. At the time, a single word was spelled out in t-shirts on the ridge near the beach that spelled out HELP. So back at the staging area, Monroe volunteered to navigate the same landing craft to, to rescue the Marines from enemy fire. Once they started nearing the beach and they were braving enemy fire, Monroe directed the landing craft to push forward even with Japanese forces gaining ground and nearing the beach. The rescue crafts were accompanied by Louis B. Chesty Puller himself. As the Marines re-embarked on the landing craft, Douglas Monroe immediately navigated his vessel between the enemy fire and the Marine forces, providing them cover so they could get off of the island. With all of his efforts, all the Marines, including the wounded, were safely taken taken off the island from that excursion, including Lieutenant Colonel Louis B. Chesty Puller. At the same time, the Japanese forces began firing machine gun rounds and Monroe was struck with a single bullet. He ended up dying on September 27th in 1942 at age 22 before the forces returned to the staging area. Now, Douglas Monroe, who was in the Coast Guard, was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions that day after having been nominated for it by Lieutenant Colonel Louis B. Chesty Puller himself. To this day, Monroe is the only Coast Guardsman to ever have been awarded the Medal of Honor. So just a fun fact about that day. Now, fortunately, because of his efforts and the efforts of the other people that were evacuating the Marines, they were able to get evacuated successfully thanks to the rescue efforts of the landing crafts and the people piloting them. And also by being covered by destroyer fire and the machine guns of a Marine SPD that was overhead covering them. Now, this whole situation, this whole screw up cost 60 Marines lives and then 100 of them got wounded, but it proved to them that they were going to encounter serious resistance if they tried to push westward. Now, on 30th September, unexpectedly, a B-17 carrying Admiral Nimitz made an emergency landing at Henderson Field, but since they landed, they figured they'd make the most of the opportunity. He visited the front line, saw Edson's Ridge, and talked to a number of Marines. He also reaffirmed Vandegrift that his overriding mission was to hold the airfield, and that was still the primary mission. He promised everybody that he would provide all of the support that he could possibly muster, and then he awarded the Navy Cross to a number of Marines, including Vandergrift, and then left the next day, visibly encouraged by what he'd seen. At this time, they decided, okay, we need to make another push out to the Montanacal because we need, we need to get out there and start clearing this stuff out. This time, when they did the attack, they were going to conduct it with five infantry battalions. There was going to be five infantry battalions consisting of 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, and 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. So on the 7th, 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines moved into the jungle about 2,000 yards upstream on the Matanikau, encountering Japanese troops that harassed his forward elements, but not in enough strength to stop the advance. He bypassed the enemy positions and dug in for the night. Behind him, the 7th Marines followed suit. They prepared to move through his lines, cross the river, and attack north towards the Japanese on the 8th of October. The 5th Marines assault battalions began moving towards the Matanikau on the 7th and they ran into Japanese in strength about 400 yards from the river. The fighting was intense and 3rd Battalion 5th Marines could make little progress, although 2nd Battalion 5th Marines encountered a slight opposition and won through the riverbank. Now, weather was awful on the 8th of October. It was raining all day long, virtually stopping all forward progress, but it didn't halt the close in fighting around the Japanese pocket. The enemy troops finally retreated, attempting to escape the gradually encircling Marines, though. They smashed into the raiders' position nearest their escape route. A wild hand-to-hand -hand battle ensued, and a few Japanese broke through to reach and cross the river. The rest died fighting. Chesty Puller's battalion discovered a number of Japanese in a raving to his front, fired his mortars, and called in artillery, while his men used rifles and machine guns to pick off enemy troops trying to escape what proved to be a death trap. So it was a hard-fought slugfest back and forth at Matanikau, just trying to get across that damn river. So General Vandergriff got in 
intelligence that there could be a very big Japanese attack coming very soon from the West. And so what he decided to do was consolidate all of their positions and essentially make sure that there was no large Marine force that on that side that was more than a day's march from the perimeter. So that way, if they needed to get out of there, they, ha they were, had the ability to. Another thing that was a real problem out there during this period of time for both sides was disease because it was taking tons of people out and actually was equaling the amount of casualties that were as a result of battle. So there are things like crippling stomach cramps, gastroenteritis, jungle rot, tropical fungus infections, uncomfortable rashes on people's feet, armpits, elbows, crotches. A lot of that stuff is caused because you're wet for a long time. And if you can't get dry, it causes all these, it causes a lot of issues. And even if it wasn't raining, it was so humid and you're sweaty so much all the time, it just like there's constant moisture all over your body. On top of that, there's hundreds of cases of malaria. Now, the people that were affected by this the most were a lot of the guys that had been on the island since the initial invasion and hadn't been eating very well and were kind of malnourished because their bodies just weren't strong enough to fight off illness as much as like, say, 7th Marines was because they got there and they were a little bit fresher. Unfortunately, there was not going to be any relief for any of the men that were on their third month of being on Guadalcanal. And the Japanese were not going to easily abandon their plan to retake the airfield, so... At one point, General Hyakutake himself actually landed on Guadalcanal on 7 October to oversee the, the coming offensive that they were planning. On October 11th, U.S. Navy surface ships took a hand in stopping the Tokyo Express, the nickname that had been given to Admiral Tanaka's almost nightly reinforcement forays. A covering force of five cruisers and five destroyers commanded by Rear Admiral Norman Scott kept getting word that many ships were approaching Guadalcanal. He encountered more ships than he expected, unfortunately. As a result of Admiral Norman Scott's action, reinforcement enforcement convoy was able to arrive at Guadalcanal on 13 October when the 164th Infantry of the America Division arrived. The soldiers, members of a National Guard unit, were equipped with Grand M1 rifles, a weapon of which most overseas Marines had only heard of. As far as their rate of fire, the semi-automatic Grand could easily outperform the single-shot bolt-action Springfields, but most of the 1st Marine Division still believed that the Springfield was inherently more accurate and a better weapon. However, some Marines decided that they were going to snag themselves some M1 Grand, so uh, a whole bunch of them disappeared from their stockpile, and then some of the Marines ended up just having them. Who knows? Now, during this period of time, when, when soldiers, like the army was landing, the Marines would just ransack their supplies that were landing on the island and take them for themselves and then run back to their lines because they had a whole bunch of money and they had a whole bunch of gear and stuff coming ashore and they had new stuff. Several flights of Japanese bombers arrived over Henderson Field, relatively unscathed by the defending fighters, and they started dropping bombs. So the soldiers started started heading for cover because they weren't used to getting bombed all the time, but the Marines were just like kind of immune to it and like at that point desensitized. And so what they started doing is taking that opportunity to liberate cartons and crates and things like that and stealing stuff basically from the army. And they took a lot of that stuff back to their positions. At one point, the Japanese losses were extremely heavy, but they came back and succeeded in shelling Henderson Field for an hour and 20 minutes straight. All right, so at this time, the Japanese had landed more than enough troops to destroy the Marine beachhead and seize the airfield, or so they thought. So they planned to move most of their troops through the jungle, out of sight and out of contact with the Marines. They had roughly 7,000 men, each carrying a mortar or artillery shell. Now, all their men had to, like, carry, push, drag supporting arms over the miles of broken ground across two major streams through heavy underbrush. So I'm sure that it was a miserable journey. General Vandergrift knew that the Japanese were planning to an attack because they weren't just going to sit there or not do anything. So they kept pushing out reconnaissance flights and patrols. And those patrols and reconnaissance flights had clearly been able to see that the push would be coming from the west, where the enemy reinforcements were continuing to land. Now, during this period of time where there's like a lull in the attacking, General Vandergrift was visited by the Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, who was Lieutenant General Thomas Holcomb. Now, the Commandant flew in on 21 October to see for himself how the Marines were doing out there. He wanted to visit the lines. They also wanted to use this time as an occasion for both of the those generals to meet the new Southern Pacific Command Vice Admiral William F. Bull Halsey. Now, at the time, General Vandegrift was telling Admiral Halsey, like, look, man, we need some reinforcements. I need I need all of the American division over here to, like, beef up our forces. I need another 2nd Marine Division regiment to come out here and, and help reinforce us. Because, like, we've been out here for three months. My guys are getting tons of jungle fevers. They're being ravaged by disease. They're hungry. We're low on supplies. Admiral Halsey told General Vandegrift, he's like, look, you know, you go back there, and I promise you, I will get you everything that I have. Now, 
Now, on the 20th of October, an enemy patrol tried to find a way through the line held by Lieutenant Colonel William N. McKelvey Jr.'s 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines. A sharpshooting 37mm gun crew knocked out one tank and the enemy force fell back, meanwhile shelling the Marine positions with artillery. Near sunset the next day, the Japanese tried again, this time with more artillery fire and more tanks in the fore, but again a 37mm gun knocked out a lead tank and discouraged the attack. On the 23rd, the Japanese dropped a heavy rain of artillery and mortar fire on McKelvey position near the Matanikau River mouth. Near dusk, nine 18-ton medium tanks rolled out of the tree line onto the river's sandbar, and just as quickly, eight of them were riddled by the 37-millimeter guns. One tank got halfway across the river. A Marine blasted a track off with a grenade, and a 75-millimeter half-track finished it off in the ocean surf. The enemy infantry that was following was smothered by Marine artillery fire as all battalions of the augmented 11th Marines rained shells on the massed attackers. Hundreds of Japanese casualties were taken, and three more tanks were destroyed. Later, another inland thrust further upstream was easily beaten back as well. Although patrols had encountered no Japanese east or south of the jungled perimeter up to the 24th, the Matanikau attempts had alerted everyone. When General Maruyama finally was satisfied that his men had struggled enough to appropriate assault positions, after delaying his attack three times, he was ready and set on 24 October, and the Marines were waiting. Now, on the 24th of October, an observer from 1st Battalion, 7th Marines spotted an enemy officer surveying Edson's Ridge on the 24th. Fortunately, Chesty Puller was warned by the outpost and their men were waiting. Now, it was a very dark night and there was hard rain coming down. Now, just to set the tone for you, it was it was absolutely like downpour raining and it was difficult to see that night. Now, on that night, a machine gunner who happened to be a heavy machine gun section leader named Sergeant John Basilon was in charge of two heavy 30 caliber machine gun sections from Company D, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. The mission they were given was to hold a position in a narrow pass in the vicinity of the Teneru River. Suddenly, the Japanese charged out of the jungle, attacking in Puller's area near the ridge and the flat ground to the east. The Marines responded with everything they had, calling in artillery, firing mortars, relying heavily on crossing fields of machine gun fire to cut down the enemy infantrymen. Unfortunately, one of the heavy machine gun teams were disabled from the massive fires from the enemy. Sergeant John Basilone ran close to 200 meters through enemy fires, neutralizing numerous Japanese soldiers along the way with his Colt 1911 pistol that he happened to keep in his waistband all while carrying close to 90 pounds of equipment and ammo to resupply the disabled machine gun positions. Throughout the fight, Sergeant Bassalone continued sprinting between the different positions, providing them much-needed ammunition and fixing malfunctions of their machine guns. Now, throughout this fight, the machine gun barrels became so hot that you couldn't touch them or you would get burned. And at some point throughout the chaos, Sergeant Bassalone lost his heat mitts that were meant to protect his hands while he was changing out the barrels to the guns. Completely disregarding his own safety, he continued continued running back and forth, swapping out gun barrels, clearing malfunctions, and getting burns all over his hands from handling the machine guns, as he personally neutralized waves of Japanese attacking soldiers on the team's positions. Throughout the onslaught of attackers, Sergeant Baslin was personally responsible for taking out nearly 40 enemy soldiers, from what stories say, alternating between his sidearm, a machete, and his crew's machine guns. He continued those actions for three days straight with little to no sleep or food. By the time they were finally reinforced, only Sergeant John Bassalone and two other Marines from his section were still actively manning their positions. Robert K. Hall and Lieutenant Colonel Chesty Puller met up together at the head of their column and the two officers walked down the length of the Marine lines, peeling off an army squad at a time to feed them into the line. So they personally, like, fed them in where they needed to, where the gaps were in their defense. Now, throughout the course of these three days, Maruyama continued to try to do these onslaughts and these bonsai charges, but the Marine and Army lines held and the Japanese were continuing to get cut down in droves by rifle, machine gun fire, mortar fire, 37 millimeter fire, and artillery fire. Finally, on the third day at daylight, the American positions were secure and the enemy had retreated and they would not come back. All in all, throughout those days, about 3,500 enemy troops had died. The total Americans and Marines and soldiers together probably lost 300 men in total. Now, U.S. forces faced a lot of challenges during this battle. I mean, the jungle environment is extremely difficult to operate in. It was difficult to resupply them because they were constantly under threat of aerial bombardment for the transport vessels, and the Japanese Navy was heavy in, in presence out there. There was constantly counterattacks trying to push the Americans back into the sea. It was an actual slugfest, back and forth, back and forth. Other than when we first occupied the island in the first place, which went relatively smoothly, it was just constantly them going back and forth trying to retake the airstrip, Henderson Field. Now, I want to go back to Sergeant John Bassalon, the machine gun section leader who was absolutely getting after it. He went on to 
receive the Congressional Medal of Honor, which he was recommended by Lieutenant Colonel Chesty Puller for, personally. He reluctantly returned to the United States and assisted with the war bond effort. He was given the Medal of Honor, and he was eventually offered a commission and the chance to spend the rest of the war stateside. But he decided that wasn't for him, and he eventually returned back to combat. The following is his Medal of Honor citation. Attention to orders. The President of the United States of America, in the name of Congress, takes pleasure in presenting the Medal of Honor to Sergeant John Manila John Bassalone, United States Marine Corps, for extraordinary heroism and conspicuous gallantry in action against enemy Japanese forces above and beyond the call of duty while serving with the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division in the Lunga area, Guadalcanal, Solomon Islands, on the night of 24 to 25 October 1942. While the enemy was hammering at the Marines' defensive positions, Sergeant Bassalone, in charge of two sections of heavy machine guns, fought valiantly to check the savage and determined assault. In a fierce frontal attack with the Japanese blasting his guns with grenades and mortar fire, one of Sergeant Bassalone's sections with its gun crews was put out of action, leaving only two men able to carry on. Moving an extra gun into position, he placed it in action, then under continual fire, repaired another and personally manned it, gallantly holding his line until replacements arrived. A little later, with ammunition critically low and the supply lines cut off, Sergeant Bassalone, at great risk of his life and in the face of continued enemy attack, battled his way through hostile lines with urgently needed shells for his gunners, thereby contributing in large measure to the virtual annihilation of a Japanese regiment. His great personal valor and courageous initiative were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Yeah, so if you don't know who John Bassalone is, I highly recommend that you look him up. There's actually a John Bassalone Foundation, Memorial Foundation, I believe. Recommend looking into that. In any case, Sergeant John Bassalone went back. He was awarded the Medal of Honor. He did some bond drives for a little bit, but then when he, he denied getting a commission and staying in stateside, he went back to combat. And on February 19th, 19th of 1945, he arrived on Red Beach on Iwo Jima along with his team. He ended up getting killed there by an enemy artillery shell when it exploded. He was 28 years old. He was posthumously awarded the Purple Heart and the Navy Cross for his actions on Iwo Jima. Despite the difficulty that the Marines and the Navy and the Coast Guard faced out here, they demonstrated resilience and continued to push to prevail in this battle for Guadalcanal. It was just an awful vicious back and forth between aerial bombardments of ships and transport carriers and carrier strike groups you know the jungle just the adversity they faced on there like as far as like they went without resupply for like two to three months almost before seventh marines finally showed up it was just a vicious slog back and forth for the ground troops and it was just as bad for the navy because they were getting hammered with stuff man the entire time the result of this is both sides lost tons of warships and there was a ton of destructive engagements back and forth tons of people were lost. So Japan lost their battleships Hiei and Kirishima, the heavy cruiser Kinugasa, three destroyers Akatsuki, Yudachi, and Ayanami, plus a ton of transports. The U.S. lost light cruisers USS Atlanta and a Juno, and seven destroyers, the USS Barton, USS Monson, USS Cushing, and USS Laffey, USS Preston, USS Benham, and USS Walk. This was a costly campaign. Nevertheless, we succeeded in defending Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands against the Japanese attempts to hold that land and to take it back. And eventually the Japanese decided to evacuate Guadalcanal fully and leave the area by February of 1943. Now, other than the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the last major naval battle that happened in the Pacific War was Guadalcanal. Like I said, it was one of the costliest battles that we, we had waged out there. I think U.S. forces, around 7,100 people died and almost 8,000 people were wounded, including two U.S. Navy admirals, Rear Admiral Daniel J. Callaghan and Rear Admiral Norman Scott. Now the Japanese forces had lost more than 19,000 personnel and they have we have no idea how many number of people were wounded on their side. Absolutely insane. There was a ton of awards handed out to a ton of different people for unbelievable acts of heroism including a lot of pilots. Like I would Highly recommend you look into what some of these pilots did because they were responsible for doing everything from scouting and reconnaissance to supporting and destroying the enemy transport ships that were constantly trying to bring troops ashore. They were responsible for fighting off the, the bombers that were coming in and dropping bombs on Guadalcanal. I mean, they did a ton of stuff and went through a lot. And the Navy got absolutely hammered during this. I mean, it was, it was stark, the number of casualties 
and the amount of money that was lost and the amount of ships that were sank on both sides. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Hopefully you learned something today. I certainly did. And I'll see you in the next video. Until next time.